the topic of discussion for today is uh, non odontogenic cysts uh, wherein these are different from the odontogenic cysts in that these are derived from remnants of embryonal processes so now let's go in detail of them so basically these uh, non odontogenic cysts they are also called as fissural cyst why so see this is a picture of an embryo wherein it is showing the development of face from these processes here that is medial nasal process lateral nasal process maxillary process mandibular processes which are fusing together so whenever there is a fusion of these embryonal process there will be few remnants which will remain always so these fissural cysts these are the cysts which are derived from epithelial cells which are entrapped and between the embryonic processes of bone set union lines so because these cysts are developed from these uh, fissures these are also called as fissural cysts and all and are also called as inclusion cysts so now going on into the classification how do we classify these non odontogenic cysts so they are classified based on their location that is whether they either they are in the bone or whether they are in the soft tissue so likewise we have interosseous cysts that is which are present within the bone and we have extraosseous cysts which are present within the soft tissue under interosseous cysts we have nasopalatine duct cysts median palatine cyst globulo maxillary cyst and median mandibular cyst under extraosseous cysts or soft tissue cysts we have palatine palatal cysts of newborn nasolabial cysts thyroglossal duct cysts oral lymphepithelial cyst and epidermoid cyst now let's go into detail of each cyst so firstly we will see about nasopalatine duct cyst so this nasopalatine duct cyst it is the most common of all these non odontogenic ones which is present in the midline of anterior maxilla now here is a picture which is showing the location of an incisive canal so the basically the nasopalatine duct it is present within this incisive canal and it is formed during palate formation so usually it will undergo progressive degeneration later on but sometimes there will be persistence of few epithelial remnants so these epithelial remnants they become the source of epithelium to give rise to nasopalatine duct cyst so these are the cells which will proliferate to produce this duct cyst so how does it appear clinically that is clinical features so this is a clinical picture of nasopalatine duct cyst wherein there is a swelling in the midline of anterior maxilla so sometimes it presents with the pain and uh, if uh, the cyst is growing larger that is large cyst sometimes they may erode the labial and palatal bone also resulting in fluctuant swelling so how it will appear radiographically there is a well circumscribed radiolucency in or near the midline of anterior maxilla between the central incisors like in this picture usually it shows a classical heart shaped radiolucency can you see this there is a heart shaped radiolucency sometimes it can be round or oval also and histopathologically nasopalatine duct cyst it shows highly variable epithelial lining so here is a uh, uh, cystic lining which is pointing to the cystic lining so this it this variable epithelial lining it depends upon the localization of the cyst that is stratified squamous or it can be pseudo columnar it can be simple columnar whereas the connective tissue will show chronic inflammation and sometimes even the capsule shows small to moderate sized nerves arteries and veins because of the presence of incisive canal and incisive nerves so this is about nasopalatine duct cyst next moving on to the next one median palatine cyst so how does this median palatine cyst so here is a picture uh, sh which shows uh, secondary palate formation that is from the palatal shelves which are moving towards each other to fuse in the midline so whenever these palatal shelves they fuse in the midline there will be few epithelial cells which will be entrapped along the embryonic line of fusion so with the epithelial cells which are entrapped will become remnants and whenever these remnants they get stimulated it give rise to median palatine cyst 
so median palatine cyst name itself shows so where does it present clinically it is present along the midline of hard palate and it is present as a firm and fluctuant swelling usually asymptomatic only so even if you see radiographically also it it uh, presents as well circumscribed radiolucency with sclerotic border usually in the midline of palate opposite to bicuspids and molars next cyst that is globulomaxillary cyst usually uh, this is a picture of uh, processes on the near the maxilla wherein globulomaxillary cyst it is thought to arise at the junction of globular process of median nasal process and maxillary process like in this picture so usually it will be asymptomatic only so uh, this cyst it is present between the maxillary lateral incisors and canine teeth like here cyst is present between maxillary lateral incisors and canine so radiographically if you see this particular cyst it uh, characteristically it shows an inverted pear shaped radiolucency like in this picture between the roots of lateral incisor and canine usually causing the divergence of roots of these teeth i can see the divergence of the roots and these teeth will be vital in nature here also the cyst will be lined by stratified squamous epithelium only next moving on to median mandibular cyst it is a very very rare cyst usually it occurs in the midline of the mandible like uh, in the name and there are various theories which are proposed the first theory is that it is formed from epithelial remnants which are entrapped in the median mandibular fissure during fusion of bilateral mandibular arches so this epithelial remnants along median mandibular fissure theory it is disapproved by many why because mandible usually develops as a single bilobed mesenchymal proliferation that means there is no fusion it is a single bone as there is no fusion there is no there are no epithelial remnants that means there is no median mandibular cyst itself so what is this cyst basically so some other authors have given other theories like it is an odontogenic cyst itself which is formed due to cystic degeneration of enamel organ of any supernumerary tooth germ some authors told that it is a lateral periodontal cyst which is arising in midline so how does it appear clinically it is basically asymptomatic only and uh, usually on routine radiographic examination only we can find this here radiographically it will appear as unilocular well defined radiolucency which is present between the two central incisors like this so this is about median mandibular cyst next moving on to soft tissue cyst or extraosseous cyst the first one is palatal cyst of newborn so there are two things under this that is epstein pearls and bones nodules which have different different uh, origin so firstly we'll see epstein pearls uh, you remember uh, talking about median uh, median palatine cyst wherein uh, palatal shells they fuse together to form Uh, secondary palate right so wherein epithelial remnants are formed it is the same way even here epstein pearls are formed from these epithelial remnants the main difference is that here it is a soft tissue cyst whereas in case of median palatine cyst it is a hard tissue cyst so this is about epstein pearls next we'll see bones nodules so in the hard palate and soft palate we can see numerous minor salivary glands so during the development of these minor salivary glands if while fusion there will be numerous remnants which are formed so if at all from these remnants if there are any soft tissue cysts which are produced they are called as bones nodules so epithelial pearls are from palatal fusion bones nodules are from minor salivary gland remnants so this is a picture of epstein pearls wherein so epstein pearls uh, they are present along the mid palatine raphe whereas bones nodules they are present as soft papules along the uh, at multiple areas of the palate so these will be present as uh, yellow or white mucosal papules and with keratin filled cyst so both bones nodules and epstein pearls will be yellow white mucosal papules only but the location will be different next cyst is nasolabial cyst which is also called as nasoalveolar cyst it's also called as cladstad cyst so it's a very rare fissural cyst which is formed along the junction of globular process of median nasal process the lateral nasal process and the maxillary process so here there are three processes 
and uh, it is formed from the epithelium entrapped along this fusion line so how does it appear clinically so this is a clinical picture which shows a swelling of the upper lip lateral to the midline and it also results in the elevation of ala of the nose as you can see there the ala of nose is elevated and it is present lateral to the midline so how does it appear intraorally so there will be obliteration of the vestibule as well as the maxillary mucobuccal fold so histopathologically how does it appear so it contains pseudo stratified columnar epithelium so the epithelial lining what you see here is pseudo stratified columnar epithelium and the one what it is pointing towards is numerous goblet cells those white white cells are nothing but goblet cells which are which also show cilia the next cyst thyroglossal duct cyst so first we'll see how does it form so during the development that is during third to fourth week of intrauterine life thyroid gland develops in the floor of the pharyngeal gut so but by seventh week this thyroid gland descends into the neck into its final resting position which is anterior to trachea and larynx so the site where it descends the later it becomes foramen cecum okay but along this path of descent there will be an epithelial tract or a duct which is formed maintaining an attachment to the base of the tongue which is thyroglossal duct like you can see in this picture that is a thyroglossal duct this becomes intimately associated with the developing hyoid but the thyroglossal duct epithelium normally undergoes atrophy but sometimes some remnants remain which later give rise to thyroglossal duct cyst so this is a picture showing uh, those red red dots which are uh, shown here they are nothing but thyroglossal ducts which are formed from the remnants of this thyroglossal duct epithelium so how does it appear clinically so it appears as a midline neck mass at or below the level of hyoid bone usually this thyroglossal ducts it moves up with the swallowing and sometimes it may show neck or throat pain and dysphagia also and histopathologically these thyroglossal ducts they are lined by columnar or stratified squamous epithelium so here it is columnar epithelium with cilia and the connective tissue wall it shows uh, patches of thyroid tissue so all these things they are nothing but they are thyroid follicles and sometimes mucus glands are also seen so this is about thyroglossal ducts next we will go on into oral lymphoepithelial cyst normally oral cavity contains lymphoid tissue principally in the form of lymph valdius ring so these are uh, which contains adenoids tubal tonsils palatine tonsils lingual tonsils all these form a valdius ring sometimes accessory lymphoid aggregates are also formed within floor of the mouth ventral surface of the tongue and soft palate so this picture shows the valdius ring so these lymphoid tissue they will have a close relationship with the overlying mucosal epithelium whenever this epithelium develops invaginations into the tonsillar tissue they result in blind pouches or tonsillar crypts which are filled with keratin debris so oral epithelium making invaginations into these tonsillar tissues give rise to oral epithelial cyst clinically how does they appear they are movable painless submucosal masses which are white or yellow because of the presence of keratinous material and the most common sites will be floor of the mouth ventral surface of the tongue lateral border of the tongue all these and uh, histopathologically we will see a keratin filled cyst so this is keratin the one which is pointing keratin filled cyst it is surrounded by numerous lymphoid follicles the second arrow represents the lymphoid follicles so next moving on to a very rare cyst which is an epidermoid cyst so usually this epidermoid cyst it is uh, formed by uh, sequestration as or uh, implantation of these epithelial rests or it can be because of surgical implantation of the epithelium into the jaw mesenchyme also so how does it appear clinically they are basically very slow to progress and remain asymptomatic they appear as firm round mobile yellow or white subcutaneous nodules sometimes a characteristic feature is that a central pore or punctum is formed sometimes there will be discharge of some foul smelling cheese like material also from these epidermoid cysts 
so histopathologically how does they appear so usually they contain stratified squamous epithelial lining okay, this is the stratified squamous epithelial lining which is filled with keratin in laminar pattern so the second arrow it uh, it represents the keratin which is present in laminar pattern that is onion ring pattern so this is about epidermoid cyst it is a very rare cyst altogether so this is about non odontogenic cysts okay so these are the various non odontogenic cysts and usually questions can come as fissural cysts or inclusion cysts which are uh, which are all the same 